one item, and um, I'd like for the CLA to read the description into the record. Good morning, Madam Chair. Raphael Prater with the CLA's office. Item, one item agenda, it was just a CAO report relative to the Board of Water and Powers Commissioner's proposed implementation of shortage year rates designed to encourage water conservation. I don't believe we have representatives from the CAO's office here yet. Okay, are they on their way? I, yes. Okay, will somebody call them and tell them yeah. I would like for them to show up. Uh, in the meantime, uh, this, I believe, has been set for council later this week. Um, yes, it's, it's scheduled for council consideration tomorrow. And uh, okay. that's the final day for the council to consider it. No action. It's deemed approved. An approval action, of course, and it's approved. Uh, a disapproval action then gets referred back to the Board of Water and Power Commissioners. Okay. Uh, just some basic comments, and I'm going to start calling on people to come up and speak. Okay. Uh, uh, some background information. This 15% rate increase is a commodity charge that acknowledges the three-year drought, drought, drought and the governor's uh, call to state of emergency. Uh, the Metropolitan Water District is a major water supplier for the city of L.A., and the snowpack runoff, which is our major source of water, has been reduced significantly. Uh, recycled water uh, only attributes to 1% of our supply. I think our CAO has arrived. Um, last year, the council approved a water rate ordinance that will allow uh, DWP to increase water rates in the event of a drought. Um, this action is subsequent to the adoption of the ordinance, and we are, in fact, now in an emergency drought situation, which allows the department to adjust rates accordingly. Um, we will uh, ask uh, the CAO or the city attorney uh, if the rate change uh, is in conformance with the memo MOU with the neighborhood councils. Uh, in addition, I will ask the department to explain the direct impact of the rate payers. Uh, the response to the drought also creates an incentive to conserve more water so that ratepayers uh, will not feel an increase in their bills. This is a two-tier system that encourages water conservation. When you stay in the first tier, you can't avoid the higher rate. And with that, I think the CAO is here now. If you could come to the table uh, and uh, make some comments on the record, I would appreciate it. Olivia Seves Val Lunga from the CAO's office. Per your request, we uh, evaluated the information provided by the Department of Water and Power regarding the water rate for a water shortage year. What we did was compare the information as provided by them and did a little bit of background on the genesis of the, of the rates as uh, prescribed by the department. What we found was that this information is based on the water rate ordinance that was adopted as a result of the Blue Ribbon Committee that met in 1992 after the drought of that year. And it was later revised in 1993 as a result of some concerns that have, were brought up by uh, the council and concerned citizens regarding some of the issues that hadn't been addressed that could have led to some inequities. Some of these issues were low income and lifeline subsidies, uh, the sizes of the lots, the temperature zones, and the size of the household. All of these were then uh, adopted in March of 1995. As such, in that ordinance, the board could establish when the water supply of the city was could not mean the could not meet the demand of the city residents. So as a result, the board was to declare a shortage rate from either 10, 15, 20, or 25 percent. In this case, we are at 12 percent shortage, which then would have to be rounded up to a 15 percent shortage which is what the DWP is, in fact, doing per the ordinance. After reviewing a lot of the information that was presented in the PowerPoint presentation in the last committee, we found that, in fact, the, what is changing are not the rates themselves. What is changing is the allowance. The uh, Tier 1 and Tier 2 allowances are changing in terms of how much water you can use. 
the water that you can use is 15 percent lower in billing units, which are represented by 100 acre feet. So the rate has not changed, just the units. So you get to use 15 percent less units if you are in Tier 1. So if you can serve, you will pay the same amount that you would have had you had it not been a shortage year. But if you continue to use the same amount and you flow into Tier 2, which is now 15 percent lower, then you would pay a higher rate. What I found after looking at some of the um, information on their average usage, found that the average usage of a Tier 1 was lower than the average usage of what it would be in a shortage rate. So the average year is 12.5 usage. Tier 1 uses an average of 8.5, 100 acre feet. So they are, are already within the limit of conserving. So their rates would not go up. Only the high users would see an increase of anywhere about $5. So 85% of the Tier 1 users would, would either not see an increase or could actually see a decrease. And that was verified because I went up to DWP and had them pull random samples of different bills that I could use that were represented on the charts that were on the PowerPoint that was presented last week. Um, so basically, based on everything that I looked at, and I don't know in terms of usage of time, if you want me to go into a lot of detail. I, I think what we'll do, and I also want to recognize the presence of Mr. Garcetti and Ms. Gruel here at the committee, uh, I'm going to give you some questions that okay. I want you to just be prepared to answer when it comes to counsel on the record. Um, um, if any of my colleagues have questions right now, um, otherwise, we'll give each speaker um, a minute each so we have uh, ev give every single person a chance to speak before 10 o'clock. Okay. And then we can put our questions on the record at the very end. Um, so, I mean, basically our recommendation would be that we, we, we do proceed with the water uh, rates, the water shortage rates. Okay. Any questions or comments from colleagues? We'll wait. No, I'll wait. Okay, great. All right, great. Why don't we do this so that everybody has a chance to speak before 10? Uh, first speaker is Steve, I think it's Twinning. Twining, followed by Dr. Clyde Williams. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. How are you all? Good. Good. How are you? I'm Steve Twining, uh, representing the Bel Air Beverly Crest Neighborhood Council. I'm also on the DWP um, the Neighborhood Council Committee. Um, we've got a number of questions. Does the possible water shortage preclude DWP from keeping rate payers and neighborhood councils informed about rate increases associated with shortage year water rates, question mark. We recognize a need for water conservation even in plentiful times. We appreciate the efforts of DWP in uh, informing the rate payers and neighborhood councils and citizens of LA about water conservation. However, these specific rates were implemented without notifying rate payers and neighborhood councils and without their input. Assuming no conservation and tier two, tier two usage of around 25 percent of the total, water bills will increase about 18 percent. If savings of 15 percent are achieved, not an easy task. The bill will be the same. There are many questions that need answering. Um, if you'd like, sir, if you can give a copy of that uh, to the clerk, and we can put that in the official file, okay. and it can used to be enhanced, uh, used to enhance the uh, CAO's report. Thank you. Um, Quite a bit more. I understand. Mr. Dr. Williams. And then following Dr. Williams will be uh, Tony Butea. Okay. Sorry, I can't read your writing. Okay. <laughs> We're also joined by Mr. Alarcon. Okay, Dr. Williams. Okay. Uh, Dr. Clyde Williams, 4115 Barrett Road, El Sereno. I'm going to be rather quick. Uh, DWP rates do not promote water conservation. I myself have a one inch connection for five people and we use 50 gallons per person per day and that will be our tier one rate. However, we have to now reduce by 15 percent. Somebody that's been using 100 gallons has to reduce by 
33 percent of our total use. This also includes the lifeline users, the low income users, all have to reduce by 15 percent. Generally, they're already reduced. And this is going to be a windfall revenue generator for DWP and maybe for the city. And it doesn't seem right. No procedure for appeal. We can only appeal to this afternoon's board. Thank you very much, Dr. Williams. Uh, Mr. Butka. Following Mr. Butka will be Soledad Garcia. We're also joined by Mr. Cardenas. Good morning. My name is Tony Butka. I'm chair of the Glacelle Park Neighborhood Council and part of the DWP committee. Uh, my comments relate to process. Once again, um, there is not a sudden water shortage in Los Angeles that demands action within 30 days by the city council to increase rates. What's happened is, once again, DWP acts hastily, conducts minimal or no outreach. There's a quick E&E &E committee meeting with the city council, and tomorrow it's on the city council's agenda, and it's a fait accompli. Nowhere in this process is there any opportunity to have a meaningful discussion with any of the neighborhood councils to attempt to get buy-in, to attempt to get dialogue. While I understand the statutory scheme of things and that you may or may not be able to do it without violating the charter, it sure isn't the way to obtain consensus in the city of Los Angeles, and I would urge you to attempt to do so before you act. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Ms. Garcia. <coughs> and then following uh, Ms. Garcia will be Jim Clark. Good morning. I agree the, with the need to reconstruct the new water cheering to lessen the financial impact. The community is not ready for this new plan because it has not been communicated. The outreach protocol has been neglected. The DWP MOU and Article 9 have not been followed. The first time that a new cheering was mentioned was on March 14th. There were no specifics as to cost and impact. The new cheering was developed without input from the neighborhood councils and public. The argument that, the, that this is an emergency is without merit. Drought conditions have been in effect five or six years. A new conservation plan was announced last year. The public, again, was not, did not have any input. Extended field presentations after the fact are not good faith outreach endeavors. It should be observed and it should be obvious by now that where the community is set aside and without, without input, there will be some type of backlash. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Clark. And following Mr. Clark will be D.D. Audit. Or Audet. Madam okay. Chairman, uh, Chairperson, sorry. Uh, members of the committee, thank you for uh, having me. I'm Jim Clark with the Apartment Association of Greater Los Angeles. I'm going to be reiterating myself, and I want to know. I want you to know that I've submitted a letter also to the committee, and I think uh, you may have received one in your offices yesterday. The bottom line is this plan will not work. Two thirds of this city don't pay for their own water. They're renters in master meter buildings where the owner pays for the water. They don't pay for their water. There is no incentive for them to save. So I urge you to reject this plan. Granted, we have a water crisis, but there's got to be another way. This plan will not work, and it's not fair to owners, mom-and-pop landlords that pay for this water. They have no control of the consumption, yet they will be penalized for, for uh, the, the usage if it does not uh, fit into that 15 percent reduction. It's not fair. It won't work. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Is it Audet? Oh, thank you. I'll, I'll, I'll respond to Odette, too. <laughs> okay. Um, sorry to be late, but thank you folks for being here and trying to take care of our problems. Uh, I have a basic position, which is that prohibition does not solve problems. And Los Angeles has some huge problems that have to be solved. And I really wanted to be here. I'm sorry I was late to let you know that later on today at the ad hoc committee, I'm going to repeat the same message. Prohibitions solve nothing. What we need is problem solving. On Friday, I had the opportunity to speak with Manuel Perez, the assembly uh, member from the 80th district. Now, he's familiar with water problems because he's got a lot of 
uh, farmers out there in his district. And I asked him, he's chair of the, I'm sorry to go over, but I think this is important. I think you want to hear it. Okay, if you can just wrap he, this up. He responded very well to what I asked him to do. He's chair of the stimulus um, committee from the assembly. I said, can you get some of that stimulus money to help us solve our problems? And you finish this conversation this afternoon in our committee? I certainly Other committee. will. Okay, you can start at the point that you stopped today. <laughs> thank you. All right, thank you very much. Um, so in order for my colleagues to be able to go downstairs, start the council meeting, uh, especially the council president, I'll ask him first if he had anything he wanted to put on thank the record you. Just, before he uh, departs. Three things. One, um, I would like to ask the DWP to create a program whereby apartment owners, if they educate and work with their tenants to reduce their water consumption by a certain percentage, would get cash or rate incentives as an extra bonus beyond the savings accumulated from water conservation that can be passed through to residents as a financial incentive for them to consume less. I do agree with the point that we don't have, you know, some way of being able to incentivize this, and I think that's one way. You know, the flip side is obviously some sort of greater pass through which we'd have to amend the rent stabilization ordinance for, but we've done that before on water I, I, when I chaired the housing committee. That could be the other way of looking at it if we see an increase that there's some way that, that owners could pass on a, a percentage of that or a higher percentage, but I'd like to look at that. Second, for low-income customers, I want to know how these rate impacts impact low-income customers. If we could get a report back on efforts on outreach and to provide incentives to low-income uh, customers. And then last committee, I asked for a report on the department's plan to deal with businesses that consume water as a part of their business model, um, and just still awaiting that. So those are my, my only three points. Okay. And I need to run downstairs. So I right. Ms. Rule. And just a, a quick question with DWP present, um, because I had a, a little bit of a briefing on the 15%, the um, and I'm not sure, I think some may have understood that and some may not. And the 15%, it is if your average if your average is uh, for your household, just to be able to explain this percentage, um, as you did to, to me this morning, which is it's not 15% from where you were a year ago. Correct. Um, if you could describe that <clears throat> as you did this morning. Absolutely. The, the, the Jim, would you identify yourself? I'm sorry. Jim McDaniel, Assistant General Manager for Water, <coughs> LA Department of Water and Power. Um, the uh, shortage year rate concept is based on the fact that every one of our single-family homeowners has a water budget that's been developed. What we're asking for is a reduction of 15 percent in their budget, which is the amount of water that they're uh, entitled to purchase at the Tier 1 rate. Those customers who are already conserving a lot of water are going to be well within their Tier 1 budget and probably will not have to do anything, and they certainly won't be impacted by this. The vast majority of the customers fall into this category. So, so it's not that everybody has to cut back 15 percent from some base period. It's based on 15 percent from the, the water budget that they've been living with for the last 15 years. So you used me as an example this morning, which is, <clears throat> I think if my notes are correctly, that my average for my household, my budget, is mm -hmm. a 34. Correct. Okay. And so <clears throat> I would have to do 15 less than, 15 percent less than that. Right. Um, and my current rate is 13, I think. So I right. already fit in that category, so I would not be increased. Correct. Okay. I could still conserve more and, and do even more. And but, save money. And save money by, by doing that. But that if you... <clears throat> Well, good question. That's what I asked this morning um, as well, which is how can the public understand what their average is to understand where they would fit in this? Um, and I think as there were two things, Steve, that they explained to me was, one, you can call the call center today, and they could tell you for your household what your average was and what your number is. But it's not available online yet, but should be by... By May 1st. May 1st. I believe the target date. I'm trying to um, confirm that, but I believe that's Trying date. to confirm that because we just met this morning. Um, to be able to educate people so that if you've been a good conserver, you will not be dinged at all. It's not 15% from where you have been if you've been a, a, a great resident of Los Angeles. And I think that message has to get out. It's for those people who have not been conserving at all and are even with their 15% are still going to be above 
um, their average for that area. But I think an education process is, is part of that. And, and one of the things we'll want you to do in, in council as well is describe how the outreach is going to work to educate people and some and, of the And we are going to have a, the same discussion in council because I want to make sure everybody gets downstairs in a reasonable period. <laughs> Um, so let's put our questions on the record. Ms. Grohl, do you have any other questions you want to put on no, the no, record? No, no, I just wanted to okay. because that was an issue brought up right today that people understand that. Okay, Mr. Alarcon is next and Mr. Cardenas. <clears throat> yes, in the report there's a lot of talk about the rate and the structure, uh, but there's very little talk about how the Department of Water Power Commissioners made the determination that there was uh, insufficient water supply to, uh, to meet the normal uh, demands. Uh, what is the science behind that determination? Where where did we uh, where do we? I mean, as I, as I understand it, Metropolitan Water District has not even uh, given their allocation yet. So how could we determine that there's not enough water? Um, we the Metropolitan Water District will be meeting next week to make their allocation determination. As you say, Councilman. Uh, we have uh, indications from them that they're looking at uh, either a 10 or 15 percent uh, reduction. The, the proposal that, we're, uh, that we've made and that the CIO has analyzed uh, is adequate to meet either the 10 or the 15 percent. In fact, it would be required for us to, to balance supply and demand under either mm -hmm. of those two scenarios. But they haven't voted on that. They have not yet voted on it. So why are we taking action before them? Uh, we feel that due to the, the lead time that's necessary to, to publish uh, the, the rates under, uh, I think, under Prop 218, Correct. Um, and for the uh, customers to be able to receive the right kind of price signal in their bills, if we waited until after MET took action, some of the customers wouldn't even see this until the summer was over with, and we'd lose much of the advantage of the shortage year rates. But the, the city's ordinance requires that the board determine the water supply available to the city is insufficient to meet the city's normal demands. You have no specific action by MWD to to uh, determine that it that it uh, that it I mean there there is no board action to say that our allocation is going to be reduced so I don't believe you can legally do this I, I would defer until the met met acts um, uh, Mr. Alec, the, the the evidence that was adduced before the Board of Water and Power Commissioners, and if you want to have a copy of the board report introduced into the record here, I believe it's part of the file that came over to the council, but if it's missing, I'll be happy to supply a copy. But in sum and substance, the governor of the state of California has declared a drought in the state of California. We are facing significantly reduced exports from the eastern Sierra Nevada. Water from the Central Valley California aqueduct system, which comes from the Delta area, is being restricted by a judicially created drought, which is restricting um, allocations of water to Southern California. And we are on fair notice from the, from the Metropolitan Water District that we are going to face a reduction in deliveries. We cannot ignore the fact that these events have all taken place. And my legal advice would be that the the findings of the Board of Water and Power Commissioners are, su are supported by substantial evidence in the record. Well, I sure would like to. I, I don't understand why we have to uh, do this before uh, MET takes their action. Well, we, we haven't been doing so well in terms of our uh, legal position. Um, in terms of the legal position, it's really more of a hydraulic and engineering position. The question is, are we going to have enough lead time to ensure that the, the price signal goes out to encourage people to reduce water to avoid rationing water in the city of Los Angeles. I think that is the ultimate issue here. Well, I think the sky is, is falling uh, many, many times under DWP's watch, but, but um, my question is why do we have to do this before MWD acts in one week? I've been a lawyer for the city of Los Angeles for over 30 years, and I've been at DWP for 10 years. This is the first time in my entire experience that we have faced this situation. This so what? This happened many times before, sir. This so what? I'm asking why we, have to, why we can't wait one week for MWD to make that determination. Uh, final. Maybe we could ask them, MWD uh, uh, to come and be at council on Wednesday to answer that question. Yes. Yeah. Well, from a legal perspective now, the, the, the way that the ordinance was drafted and approved by the city council, the mechanism requires that, and correct me if I'm wrong, we have a, a date that is set for tomorrow. 
And you have a 30-day window. I get that. I get that. The rule of law, the reason you can't wait is because there has to be either disapproval by the council and or the mayor before that date certain or it will go into effect. So why did you put us in this position? Why didn't you wait a week? The date was selected to conform with the California constitutional mandates of notice requirements to the rate payers to ensure that the effective date for the rate modification would be applicable in time to take effect of the summer month demand. Are you asking why the DWP waited time-wise and put us in this position so we have such a short window? Well, yeah, because what I'm concerned with is we don't have a declaration from the MWD as to what the allocation is. We have some evidence that they are going to reduce it. I grant all that, but I don't understand why we are being put in the position of making a decision before MWD makes their determination. The timing, sir, was all generated on both constitutional and statutory mandates for timing of the notification. Under the statute, it could have been set at 15 days, no less than 15 days. And as I recall, when this was before the Board of Water and Power Commissioners, a request from the council came in for the matter to be extended out for approximately 30 days. A compromise was struck simply because of the publication and the notification requirements and how long it's going to take us to print and publish and get out to the rate payers the notification. And if it's delayed beyond the date that was selected, it was going to be impossible to have the new price signal rate in effect in time to have an impact upon the summer demand schedule. We need to be more efficient. I beg your pardon, sir? We need to be more efficient with our bureaucracy. We're responding to legal mandates, sir. Well, it just concerns me that we are triggering this without a final determination with regard to our allocation from MWD. And it's just not right to go to the rate payers again with potential increases. And I know the report says it's neutral, but it's neutral on balance. Some people are going to have to pay more. And we're doing it before MWD declares that our allocation is going to be changed. And so I just don't like the way that we force ourselves into these corners under short windows of opportunity. And I'm not convinced that there wasn't a better way to do this, notwithstanding the legal mandates. Why don't I ask our CLA if they can make arrangements to have somebody from MWD present at Wednesday's council meeting as we drill down a little deeper on that issue, too. Okay. Mr. Cardenas. Now, the City of Los Angeles has other ways in which we can conserve water. What's the status within the city of our water conservation situation? Currently, we're under phase one of the emergency water conservation ordinance, and we are enforcing the prohibited use provisions under that ordinance, the prohibitions against hosing down of paved surfaces, watering in the middle of the day, not fixing leaks, that sort of thing. We've issued over 2,400 citations. About 40 to 50 of those have been monetary fines, and some of them, there's even a few that have gone to the second level of fines. For the most part, citizens have responded well to the enforcement actions, but we feel that it's going to be necessary not only to continue with the phase one, but also to implement the phase three of the emergency conservation ordinance. That's currently under review with the mayor's office right now. What do you mean by currently under review with the mayor's office? The legal process, I guess, is that the mayor's office, Mr. Hotchkiss. It goes first to the mayor's office for his approval. It has been at the mayor's office, I think, for a short period of time now, and then under the process that is extant, it would then come to the council for its approval and review. How long has it been with the mayor's office? I don't have that information with me right now. Well, they acted February 17th, the board. So the board, the Department of Water and Power board acted on February 17th, and what was their action? It was to recommend implementation of phase three of the emergency water conservation ordinance. So technically speaking, after February 17th, it has been at the mayor's office? I believe that's correct. It would have been put together in a package from the board secretary and forwarded over. Is there a timeline in which the department is required to forward it over to the mayor's office? Promptly. Okay. So 
conceivably it's definitely been in the mayor's office throughout the entire month of march i believe that's correct ok has anybody at the department of water and power been asking the mayor's office what the status is of that yes and then what's the response that they're continuing to review it how big is the document i couldn't tell you how many pages off off the top of my head it's not it's not a huge probably three four pages the board's action so the mayor's office has been reviewing a document that is far less than ten pages for well over thirty days and the department is just sitting and waiting we've we've been following up with them asking if there's any additional information that we can provide for them to facilitate we feel it is important to get that uh... move forward does it isn't that as important as what we're doing today the the issue we're talking about today they're, they're both key key elements to uh... successful water conservation program who, who in the mayor's office uh... was holding this document who's the the point person at the mayor's office that who had is it? corresponding with the department of water power well, we've been working with uh, david lee batik and do you, uh, what's the explanation? What's the explanation for holding it for 30 days? All I have is that they're they're reviewing it. They're what? Reviewing it, analyzing it, reviewing it. Okay. okay uh, just two more quick questions on the record. <clears throat> We're at tier one. The DWP went straight to tier three. What happened to tier two? Uh, we, we looked at uh, Tier 2 uh, because of the water supply conditions uh, at the time that haven't, haven't improved significantly. Uh, we determined that it was most prudent to go to Phase 3, which is a, a two-day-a-week watering. Um, the snowpack conditions uh, statewide are at only at 82 percent of normal. That's compared to 95 percent of normal last year. Uh, San Luis Reservoir, which is one of our major state water project supply reservoirs last year, was at 90%. It's only at 54% this year. Um, due to a, and all that information has been made available to the mayor's office? Yes. Okay. So they're aware of, of why the Department of Water and Power took the action to go to Phase 3 instead of Phase 2? Yes. Uh, one more question. Um, it seems kind of interesting that you have a, a city of 4 million people, and you're talking about, uh, what is it, Monday, Thursday watering? Yes. Uh, for residences. Um, is there any reason why the department doesn't go uh, Monday, Thursday, like for odd uh, addresses and even addresses Tuesday, Friday, or something like that? There, there's not a problem with everybody not using that much water five days a week, but only two days a week everybody's turning on those faucets or those sprinklers and things of that nature. Yeah, we took a look at that and uh, uh, to make sure there wasn't going to be a problem with that. Uh, most of the, the water system is sized for fire flow protection, which is much larger than irrigation demand. So, so the demand in, you know, increase would not be a problem for us. We did do the, the two-day basically for ease of enforcement and ease of communication, just try to keep it simple. Okay. Uh, a couple quick things, um, and I hope that you will incorporate your responses to Mr. Cardenas' questions uh, in your report tomorrow to Council, uh, particularly on the issue of timing. Um, I'm sure one of us will bring that up again, so be proactive. Uh, just in your uh, presentation tomorrow, uh, if you can be ready to speak about how many resi residential customers currently fall within Tier 2 and how that will change under this proposal the impacts to low-income and lifeline customers, and then if water rates, shortage rates are implemented, please make sure that you're ready to say when they expire. In other words, the mechanism that is in place to ensure that rates are modified or returned to their original amounts once drought conditions are over. What is the process for notifying the mayor and council? And as noted by Mr. Alarcon, MWD, is proposing a water rationing uh, program in about a week. Uh, and uh, ex give us an explanation as to why we cannot, and I understand the legal issues, but th there's a timing problem buried somewhere in here and someone's sitting on a file uh, for 30 days. Um, and let us know whether it is premature legal issues and practical issues to implement water shortage rates when MWD has one pending. Um, 
and whether your explanation on your compliance with the MOU with neighborhood councils in terms of notifying them about the rate increase and the extent of your outreach to the residents, businesses, neighborhood councils, groups, and the impact it will have on them. So be prepared to report on that. There are no further cards or questions on this item. Mr. CLA, we don't have a quorum, and so this is just an item I think that is a report. It's simply for discussion purposes only, but we would like to request that the city clerk make this report part of the file that's before the council tomorrow so the CAO can present if necessary. Thank you. And for those of you who came today to speak, I invite you to return tomorrow if you would like, if you're able. And with that, that will close this item. This is the portion of the meeting devoted to public comment for items that are not on the agenda. Anyone wishing to speak on an item that is not on the agenda is welcome to do so at this time. If not, the meeting is adjourned. Thank you very much.